Welcome to the next video in the mathematical logic series talking about propositional logic and in this video I'm going to do exercises 3 and 4 from the end of section 1.1. Okay so in exercise 3 we're going to prove that any proper initial segment of a formula is never a formula. We're going to do this by induction, formula induction. And that means that we want to prove that this claim is true for any atomic formula and that also this property is preserved when taking connectives. So to be clear, the property is the property of a formula that any proper initial segment is not a formula. So that's the property that we're talking about that we're going to prove satisfies all the conditions that you need for induction. Uh, as a note, uh, the sort of the unique reconstruction theorem tells us that every formula must satisfy at least one and at most one of the following conditions, right? Atomic or negation or bullet where bullet is either conjunction or disjunction, right? That's bullet symbol is going to be my sort of uh, not specifying whether I'm talking about conjunction or disjunction because whatever I say about it would hold just as well for one as it does for the other. So uh, anyway, the part of that theorem which claims that every formula is at least one of these is an especially easy application of formula induction. And so I'm not going to prove it, uh, and, but I am going to use it in, in this solution. So since we've already handled the base case, which is to say that the atomic formulae enjoy this property, we now want to prove the inductive case, which is that the property is preserved when taking connectives. We're going to start with the negation. If uh, we ha right, so we're going to assume that phi has this property and prove that negation phi also has this property. That means that we are assuming phi is a formula, but no initial segment of it is a formula. Now we want to prove that the same is true for negation phi. So let's take x to be any proper initial segment of negation phi. If it is empty, there is nothing to prove because the empty word is not a formula. If you want a proof that the empty word is not a formula, if you want to kind of go that far into the details of the proof, you can do that by uh, induction on the length of a formula, arguing that every formula has length at least one. But I'm not going to prove it, I'm just going to use that. It's a fairly uh, easy proof if we even need you know, to be convinced of that at all. That handles the case where x is empty. So now assume it's non-empty and therefore it must lead with the negation because it, it has something and it's initial to negation phi. So let's write x as negation y where y is some word, y is possibly empty. And uh, let's notice that y is a proper initial segment of phi now by sort of canceling the negation. Um, so anyway, that means that phi is not a formula. Now, we would like to say that, uh, well, okay, x is negation y, y is not a formula, so x is not a formula. That doesn't quite, right, that's not quite valid as much intuitive sense as it makes. So what we technically have to argue is, you know, because, right, like, nothing we have established so far directly guarantees that the negation of a non-formula is a non-formula. I mean, after all, Right. Think about if you had a non-formula and you put a paren on it. it. You know, could that be right? If you took a non-formula and put a paren on it, is the result a non-formula? Not necessarily. Right. Like there, there actually are cases where you you could do that and get a formula. Right. You could take a non-formula, put a paren on it, and get a formula. So how do we know that negation isn't like that? We don't. It's. Right, we kind of know that probably negation does work like that, but we can't, you know, assume that in a fully rigorous proof. So anyway, so we're not going to argue exactly like that. Instead, we're going to say, well, for contradiction, assume that x is equal to the negation of, right, because we know that, uh, or, or sorry, uh, right, uh, assume that x is equal to the negation of some formula, then you know, because it's also equal to negation y, you could cancel the negations, 
Now y is equal to a formula, but we already knew that y is not a formula. So that's actually how we get to the result that x is not a formula. Now let's move on to the case where uh, we're showing that the property is preserved by taking the other connectives, conjunction or disjunction. For this, we need to assume that alpha and beta are some two formulae such that no proper initial segment of them is a formula. And then we want to take this you know, newly constructed formula paren alpha bullet beta close paren and show that no proper initial segment of that is a formula. This is a lot harder than the earlier ones. And so the best thing we can do really is to pause, go prove two lemmata, and then once those lemmata are done, this will be a very easy thing to, to complete. Those two lemmata are, in particular, all formulae have an equal number of left and right parentheses. That can be proved very easily by formula induction. And the second lemma that we would want to have is that any proper initial segment of a uh, formula which, and this is a non-empty proper initial segment of a formula which has the form uh, alpha, right, paren, alpha, bullet, beta, close paren, any non-empty proper initial segment of that uh, has more left parentheses than right. So, right, so you put these two facts together, right, and if you take any proper initial segment of what we're working with here, well, either it's empty, in which case that's handled, or it's non-empty, and then two applies, telling us it has more left parentheses than right, but then we know that that can't be a formula because all formulae have equal number of left and right parentheses. So that's the structure of the argument, but we need to establish the two lemmata. So for the first lemma, we can prove this by induction on the length of the formula. So this is not formula induction, this is regular induction on a natural number n, which is the length of the formula. We'll actually start the induction at length one, and that is trivial, right? Because if you have any formula which is of length one, then any proper initial segment uh, of that, or sorry, well, um, it, it, actually this one is just true by vacuous sort of quantification that uh, it doesn't have the necessary form, and therefore the claim that we make about it sort of holds trivially. Okay, so we move on to the inductive case where we assume that this holds for every formula of the given form up to n plus 1, right? Uh, or sorry, uh, 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 of length up to n. Now we consider a formula of the given form which has length n plus 1. Now we take x to be any proper non-empty initial segment. Therefore, it must have the form open paren y, where y is some initial segment of alpha bullet beta, right? And here I am saying y is an initial segment, not a proper uh, initial segment. Also, y might be empty. But in any case, y is an initial segment of alpha bullet beta. And we can, we can consider two different cases. Either y is an initial segment of alpha, or it has the form of alpha bullet z, where z is some initial segment of beta. So let's consider these two cases, right? This is a dilemma. So we have a dilemma, right? Basically two cases. Either y is an initial segment of alpha, or it has that other form. So considering the first horn of the dilemma, suppose that y is an initial segment of alpha. I am going to use without proof this fact that any initial segment of a formula always has at least as many left parentheses as right parentheses. That is something else to prove, and I believe it should be an easy proof either by formula induction or regular induction. I would probably guess to start with formula induction since that sounds like it might be easier, but in any case, I'm not gonna prove that. I'll leave it to you to fill in that gap if you feel it's necessary. But I'm just gonna use the fact that a proper initial segment, sorry, an initial segment of a formula always has at least as many left as right parentheses. And since that's true now of y, 
and x has one more left parenthesis than y has, then y has strictly more left parentheses. Now let's consider the other horn of the dilemma, so that y is alpha bullet z, where z is some initial segment of beta. And I'll use basically the same sort of argument again, right? So uh, this now being due to the fact that all of the parentheses that y ha has must be found within alpha and z. Now alpha being a, uh, an initial segment of alpha, technically, has at least as many left parentheses as right. Z being an initial segment of beta, beta formula, so Z has at least as many left parentheses as right. So Y, again, has at least as many left parentheses as right. Again, X is left parenthesis Y, so it has one more left parenthesis, and so must have strictly more left parentheses. Okay, now lemma two is actually much easier to prove. It is a straightforward proof by formula induction, and so I'm skipping that. Okay, so for exercise number four, we want to prove the uniqueness part of the unique reconstruction theorem. Again, I'm going to do a proof by regular induction on the length of a formula. So uh, just recall what we're pr trying to prove here. The uniqueness part is saying that every formula must be at most one of the following options, atomic negation of some formula, conjunction or disjunction of some two formulae, and that the subsentences uh, are uniquely determined uh, in every case. So let's consider the base case for the induction where the length n is equal to 1, then uh, phi cannot possibly be either a negation or a conjunction or a disjunction. Those just, no matter what alpha, beta are, already have uh, too many uh, characters in them, too many letters in them, uh, so that... Uh, so that phi cannot possibly be those options, uh, so it must be uniquely, right, at most, and of course we know really is exactly an atomic sentence when its length is equal to one. Can't be any of the others, though. That's the important part of what we're proving here. And the subsentence is uniquely determined, of course, because if it just is some atomic formula, then, then it is made of you know, one of those atomic formula symbols and, and uh, can't be also made of some other, because then they would mismatch in the one coordinate that it has. So anyway, the subsentence is uh, uniquely determined as well. Let's now consider the inductive case where we assume that the claim holds for every formula of length n or up to length n. And then we're going to let phi be some formula of length n plus 1 and true, prove that the claim is true for phi. Right, so n is at least 1, so n plus 1 is at least 2. Phi cannot possibly be atomic. So we really have just three, uh, or depending on how you count, maybe even just two cases. Phi is a negation or a bullet, where bullet is conjunction or disjunction. So let's consider the case where phi is a negation of some formula alpha. And what we want to prove is that two things, right? We want to prove that phi cannot possibly also be this bullet sentence. It cannot be equal to any uh, paren alpha bullet beta close paren. And also that the subsentence alpha is uniquely determined. We can rule out the possibility that it's one of these bullet sentences because phi, by our assumption, starts with negation. Any of the bullet sentences start with a left paren. They mismatch in the first coordinate, and so it can't be both of those at the same time. Now, how about the subsentence? Well, if phi were also equal to negation beta for some other sentence beta, then you could cancel the negations, right? That you'd have negation alpha equals negation beta. Cancel the negations, alpha equals beta. Well, that just shows that the subsentence is uniquely determined.
Okay, next we want to consider the sort of remain, remaining case where we have a bullet sentence and we want to prove the following, which bullet it is, right, whether it is a conjunction or a disjunction is uniquely determined. And the subsentences are also uniquely determined. If it is a bullet sentence, it cannot possibly lead with a negation and therefore cannot be a negation of some formula. So we know that much. Now we want to imagine that our sentence can also somehow be written as left paren gamma circ delta close paren for some formulae uh, gamma and delta. Well, since right, setting these sort of equal to each other and canceling the left parentheses on the left and the right parentheses on the right, we get that alpha bullet beta equals gamma circ delta. Now, we can sort of fundamentally break this into cases depending on the sort of relationship between alpha and gamma. Either alpha is smaller than gamma, in which case it's a proper initial segment, and uh, in which case, right, if alpha is a proper initial segment of gamma, well, we already know from the earlier exercise that alpha cannot be a formula. No proper initial segment of a formula is a formula. Well, then that just contradicts what we assumed about alpha, so we can't have that. Vice versa, if gamma is shorter than alpha, gamma is the proper initial segment, therefore is not a formula, but that is contrary to our assumption as well, so we can't have that, so it follows that alpha and gamma are exactly as long, and therefore, right, just, uh, uh, you know, each one is an initial segment of the other, so they must be equal, basically. Okay, now since they're equal, we can kind of write in the equality of, you know, alpha bullet beta with gamma circ delta, we can cancel the alpha and the gamma, right? Which, by the way, alpha equal to gamma was part of what we wanted to prove in the first place. That is uh, showing that those subsentences or that subsentence is uniquely determined. So that's actually part of what we wanted to get anyway. But now that we have it, we can use it to continue. We can cancel in that equation and get that bullet beta equals circ delta. And then by just taking the initial coordinates from that equality, we get that bullet equals circ, which is another thing that we wanted to prove. So now that right there were basically like three things that we wanted to prove. We've just got two of them. And now because we know that equality, we can cancel those out and it follows that beta equals delta. That's the third thing that we wanted to prove. And so everything has now been proved.